So the first session uh, for today's event is based on urban livelihoods challenges. It looks at internal migration, uh, creating an enabling environment, social protection, and post-COVID-19 livelihood strategies. Uh, our first presenter is Mr. Varun Agarwal, co-founder and lead India Migration Now. Uh, Varun, are you online? Yes, I'm online. I'm just switching on oh. video. Oh. Right, so um, am I audible? Yes, yes, you're audible. Thank you. Right. So uh, I don't have a presentation, so I'll just give my remarks uh, like this. Right. Uh, first of all, good afternoon to everybody and thank you uh, to CSR Box and the other organizers for putting this uh, together. Um, this quick background on my organization for those who don't know. Uh, we are based out of Bombay. Uh, India Migration Now is a it basically a migration focused research, data, advocacy and increasingly uh, services oriented organization. Uh, our sort of mission is that our, you know, our sort of catchphrase you might say is that migration is an opportunity and we want to help India grab those opportunities. And, and basically like for us, our, our sort of advocacy point really is that we need to recognize the role of migration in India's uh, developmental process. So a lot of our work is oriented around that, right? So in today's presentation, I'm going to just sort of expand upon this and motivate the intervention I'm going to talk about. I will also try and sort of expand on some of the core design features for servicing migrant households. And I'll, I'll sort of talk more about that, what I mean by that. And finally, I'll talk about the intervention and, and our lessons and what we want to do going forward, right? So, like I said, um, you know, migration is a core part, core feature of India's development process. Professor Kundu elaborated and touched upon that also. Um, so, so the sort of the core question, the follow-up question for us is that this, you know, the two questions: why, despite it being a, such a core feature of our developmental process, why are migrants so invisible? Why have, is why is migration not a core part of our imagination about India's development? And this has become very apparent uh, since the lockdown. We even, those of us who work in this sector, we've known this for a long time, but it's, I think it's become very apparent the government's thinking around this is very nascent and, and, and very new. They, they haven't really considered the issue of migration in depth in their policy making. Uh, and, but, and then the other question, which is really the core motivational question, is how do we integrate migrants in destinations, like you know, destination states and cities socioeconomically? Right? And by integration, it's a multi-dimensional problem. By integration, I mean how can migrants have the same opportunities as non-migrants when they go to destinations, right? And, and, and it's a multi-dimensional problem. Um, you know, healthcare, education, skilling. Professor Kindu did a very good elaboration of skilling and if you talk about healthcare, um, edu um, you have identity, political inclusion, I'm going to touch upon that. Um, that's a very important piece. Uh, social welfare entitlements sanitation, children rights, these, these are different dimensions of what I mean by integration, right? And, and to get more specific, to even more get even more specific, the more specific question after that is to how to effectively, how can we effectively allocate and deliver public and private goods to migrant households, right? How can the government deliver social welfare in an effective way, which they, which they are struggling with as, as the Azim Premji and various surveys uh, which have come out in the last three months have demonstrated, we really struggle in, in delivering services and goods, especially entitlements to migrant, low-income migrant households in our cities, and also private goods. And I think we, we need to sort of also understand even private sector there has not done you know enough thinking and, and, and enough services catered towards migrant households. So so how can we how can we fix that? How can we remedy this? Right? So one thing we did was we built an index looking at this integration problem, something called the Interstate Migrant Policy Index. And I'll be happy to share that um, after this talk. The index has been published. It basically looks like every state in India. It looks at every policy in those different dimensions I spoke about earlier. And, and, and it gives us a score based on how inclusive and exclusive it is on paper, right? Not implementation, just on paper. And you know, there's so many barriers we found in this whole process. So out of a hundred, the average score for India was around 30, in the mid thirties. The highest score was Kerala at 60. So, you know, even on paper, forget implementation, we have a long way to go uh, in terms of it being more inclusive at the state level, which is most, arguably the most important level of migrant workers. So, why, why is this the case? Why are migrants such invisible stakeholders, right? Um, despite them being such a core part of our developmental um, process. 
and and, and this is not just true for India. I mean, in, in China, for instance, they recognize that very quickly in China. They have the hukou system. They recognize the importance of rural to urban migration. They put in place systems and policies to address that. You know, whether we agree with those policies, separate point. But the point is that they were cognizant of this at a very early stage in their development process. I recently discovered Ghana has a core migration policy, not just for internal migration, but also for external immigration and immigration. And by the way, I mean in our work we look at all three, not just internal migration. But today I'm going to reserve my remarks on internal migration. So why are migrants invisible? I think the first problem is the political exclusion. Migrant households are largely excluded from the electoral process. And, and so they usually are, most of them are unable to vote for various reasons. Um, they are unable to vote uh, in their destinations. And often because they're away, they can't vote, especially in state and central elections back home. So they don't really have a, a political voice, right? And not just voting. And I think I think we need to sort of expand our, our meaning of electoral, rep, electoral representation, right? Inclusion. The other is representation. If a migrant community wants to put out a candidate to speak for themselves in the destination city, can they do that? Not right now. Not the way the things are designed, right? So as a result, they, 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 don't, they don't have adequate political representation in destinations, also at source, which we have to keep in mind, right? And, and so the, one of the consequences of this, and there are many reasons for the second point, which is that the public policies, the way, especially our social welfare system, has been built largely for a rural, and static household, you know, that's what it's geared towards. Whereas, as Professor Kundu elaborated, you know, the, the, the new poor in India, the last 30 years, are largely urban, in the urban rural, continu in the rural urban continuum, but much more urban and, and are mobile. They're, they're migrants. The mobility is a key feature of the urban poor, right? So, I mean, but our public policies, our special social welfare system are not designed for that. And, and another very important insight, which has come from the World Bank, which, by the way, have put out a $1 billion facility to the Indian government just to address this very problem. How can you design system, you retool your system for this new kind of poor, right? So one of the other important things is that in, in the rural continuum, uh, po you know, poverty tends to be lower in density, right? But increasingly in India, we're seeing higher density poverty. And, and, and so this has huge implications in how we deliver benefits, especially, right? How we build resilience through public policy. And this is not just true for India, this is true for many countries. And the World Bank has done some excellent work, which I highly encourage people to look at. Um, finally, you know, migrant households are different from non-migrant households. They have different risk profiles. They take a lot more risks. Um, they come, as Professor Kundu touched upon already, they come from, you know, especially the, the seasonal circular migrants, what Dr. Shivasa refers to as vulnerable migrants. Um, you know, it comes from, they come from lower caste, tribal backgrounds, some of the most exploit, ex excluded communities in India. Uh, they work in exploitative, dirty conditions quite often. Uh, they enter labor markets in unfavorable terms. And finally, um, even the households are left behind, and we need to keep that in mind. The households which are left behind, especially for the longer term migrants, circular migrants, the households which are left behind, they're often women who are left behind. And Tumbe, you know, has referred to this as a feminization of Indian agriculture. Right? Women are left behind, they take care of the house, they take care of the elder payment, uh, parents, and they have to take care of the farm. You know, they're also left in a pretty vulnerable situation. So, you know, we, we have to sort of recognize this. And, 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 and so moving on to design principles. So we've done a lot of thinking around this. We come from a very, you know, very core migration studies background. We have done a lot of research around this. So the three very general principles for both public policy and, and in, even private interventions, right? One is that, Migrants are a part of a multi-locational household unit. We need to remember that migrants are a part of a household, and these are multi-locational and they're dynamic. They're not always so. Sometimes they'll be all together at the source. Sometimes they'll be split between destination and source. Sometimes multiple destination in one source. Sometimes they're all at the destination. So this shifting nature of the household has to be factored in, right? And this connects back to the second design point, which is the migration cycle. Right? We speak a lot about reverse migration. I think it's more return. Return has always been, you know, somebody asked in the, in the chat, what is circular migration? A circular migration is basically when return is, is, a, is a part of your strategy as a migrant, right? You, you, you're going to work there, then you'll go back at some point. When you go back, you know, varies. It could be a few weeks, it could be a few years, right? Mumbai taxi driver has a few years, or Naka worker who's not maybe having a good time in the city could be a few weeks. It varies, the short-term circular and long-term circulars. And then, and there, the vulnerability sort of, you know, really increases as shorter we get. That's the empirical evidence we have. So the cycle has to be kept in mind, right? 
and and in fact the cycle is is very important in the in the mindset of a migrant right so for them return is a bargaining strategy in the absence of any collective bargaining on a construction site we've seen this first hand the threat of exit to use albert hirschman's framing the threat of exit is how they get what they want how they bargain with their employer their contractors so we have to keep the cycle in mind finally across this cycle the final design principle is that there are many stakeholders migrants have a trust network it's a very complex dynamic trust network um contractors local governments employers uh, other migrants uh, you know across the migrant cycle there are there are different kinds of stakeholders and we have to recognize who they are we have to identify and quite often engage with them if we can do design effective interventions so with with that in mind let me elaborate on the intervention that we have uh, designed and implemented um so our focus was on delivering financial services and social welfare entitlements to migrant construction workers uh, uh, for now it's construction workers but we can you know we're open to sort of working with other sectors also in urban destinations right and the way we're doing it is by we're deploying a very a network of agents you know if some those of you know about financial inclusion will but have heard of the business correspondent model right so we are trying to deploy a network of agents for these agents the way they selected and the way they deployed we keep the migration cycle and the social network in mind right so 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 this is the core sort of idea behind our intervention we did a pilot with the construction industry uh, some construction industry partners and ngos uh, and a financial se- sector partner in uh, the beginning of this year between january 2020 and march 2020 that pilot actually got disrupted by covid-19 um this was with 500 workers on a major construction site um what we offered on the site was remit on site remittances we offered bank account opening and related services so, so you know if they had a dormant account we try to open it up uh, we um we offered got them debit cards issued we helped them with kyc processes helped them with id cards uh, finally we we offered them we realized financial planning was a big need so financial planning became a core part of our offering and we trained our agents accordingly um digital say we had to partner with a financial service sector provider and we looked at a cohort of workers we worked one uh, who had smartphones were a bit more savvy we we tried to work with them on on the digital savings and insurance front we offered them an app and finally uh, social entitlement which was pocw in this context right and so it's so a week this suite of services were offered to different cohorts of migrants and and while and it was a first pilot and a first search pilot that we are aware of so some of the <laughs> some of the key lessons was I'm almost done license was that there's a clear need for this the demand was was quite overwhelming the demand for such services on site there was a product service market fit if i can call it um our 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 and there were many other lessons which i can perhaps answer uh, in the q and a but uh, the next phase for us just to sort of for the others who might be interested in this is to scale up this pilot throughout the cycle because one of our lessons was we can't just focus on the destination we referring back to the design principles so we are now partnering with source uh NGOs and and partners of the source we we're talking to CAC agents in villages where districts where people come from in the cities uh we have, we're setting up a you know, helpline a customer uh, grievance redressal and support helpline we're using WhatsApp as a way to interact with those at least who are using WhatsApp and and this way we want to engage with people throughout the cycle not just when they are uh, briefly quite often at the destination right um right so my my concluding takeaway is that there has been a think we need to start thinking about migrants as a very unique uh, um sort of you know for private sector customers for the for the for the for the government more as as citizens we need to start thinking of them very uniquely they they require very uniquely tailored services and 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 how we allocate and deliver these things to them and finally we need to focus on the last mile delivery channels we need to really think about how we're going to service them but this is this has been the major failure in despite all the announcements made in the last 3 months we were unable to we were unable to communicate and and deliver services to migrant workers so i'll take a pause there thank you very much thank you varun for your presentation and uh, i request you to stay with us till end of the session uh, what we will do is we'll take questions for you and next two speakers together okay thank, thank you. you very much yeah, sure Moving on, our next speaker is Mr. Anuj Alfonso. 
Director Livelihoods and Partnerships, Magic Bus India Foundation. Anish, do we have you here online with us? Okay, um, you will share your screen, right? I will stop my screen share. but also to learn uh, from um, esteemed speakers uh, and speakers as well as you know uh, the audience the esteemed audience who are participating today they have uh, i've been noticing the questions i think wonderful questions very insightful questions and i also look forward uh, for the question answer session to actually you know answer few and also learn uh, you know uh, through the session I uh, so what i also would like to mention here is that you know my job has become very easy uh, because you know professor debolina uh, you know beautifully covered uh, the whole uh, context about skilling urban um, rural employment uh, uh, through through uh, facts and figures and, it, and, it, and she presented it very well so i think i'll be skipping those slides i have a slide there uh, second is also uh, thank you varun also for uh, your session on uh, migrants i think uh, you know so i'll probably be skipping that because i wanted to kind of make a mention through some facts and figures uh but thank you so much uh, that actually has made my uh, you know job about uh, just focusing on the interventions that we as an implementation agency we do uh, comparatively easier so i'll straight away head into uh, the structure of the uh, basic presentation one is that uh, i'll talk about key interventions and the outcomes targeted uh, then i'll move to project challenges and learnings while we uh, set out to implement these uh, interventions third is Uh, what are these new ideas or uh, who created ideas or something that we can look forward to partner with so i'll be touching upon these little bit about magic bus india foundation those who do not know about uh, magic bus uh, so we are about uh, 20 years old in the system uh, you know in the ecosystem and uh, uh, we are one of the largest and the oldest um, ngos in india so we primarily uh, do two programs one is uh, you know we work with adolescents in the age group of 12 to 17 year old um, and we 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 are into the non formal education support program wherein we have clear outcomes uh, to look at one is that there has to be continuity of education for the adolescents so there are no dropouts and they all complete their education till class 12 uh, second is uh, they uh, there is no early child marriage happening among females because you know in in, in communities like that i think that's a it's a bigger problem so uh you know we have kept that as as one of our stronger outcome and we have been able to achieve class success there a uh, third outcome is that you know at the end of class 12 a lot of them move into higher studies but what about those who can't or those who do not want to what are the livelihood opportunities for them so that's where our second program sort of kicks in which is the livelihood uh you know work that we do where we work with um, uh, young people in the age category of about 18 to 35 so we have multiple programs there so annually all put together we we do about 4 lakh children and youth um, outreach we uh, you know we we interact with about 7 lakh 50000 parents we are present in about 22 states 77 districts so these are some facts and figures i request you to kind of visit our website to know more uh, we're doing interesting work uh, you know uh, in depth work uh, high impact work uh, in, in all of these states uh, wherever we are moving on in fact i wanted to kind of share these uh, um, facts and figures and thank you so much professor debulena she touched upon all of these in terms of uh, the male versus female breakup in the urban working age population she covered that uh, she kind of also split uh, the the total urban employment uh, between wage workers as well as self employment so that's been also covered so i would not like to kind of spend um, any more time on this uh, for for the best interest of everyone's time so she also touched upon the urban employment challenge in fact varun also talked about uh, the same set of challenges from um, from the migrant migrants lens so uh, i would like to kind of just highlight the last three one if we can take a quick look at it one is you know what about the youth's aspirations because uh, the studies uh, that we just referred to um, where uh, from 1999 till about 2010 11 you know as per the census data of 5 years each 
uh, you know, but what has changed the most in the last decade is the youth aspirations in the urban cities. So how are we aligning that with the market realities? So that's one challenge. Second is women participation in workforce. It has not changed in the last uh, two decades. It, it is very, very stagnant at about, you know, 20% plus minus. So uh, how can we actually increase that? Uh, third is, uh, I will also probably be referring to our socioeconomic survey that we did uh, to actually make a point there. Uh, last is uh, livelihoods loss at large scale for all categories as a result of COVID impact now. If this is not addressed with the right set of interventions now, majority and not now, when I say now, we are talking about immediate interventions. Uh, you know, a majority of uh, them would fall deeper into poverty. Uh, so, uh, you know, Magic Bus, uh, 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 you know, does baseline studies, does uh, needs assessment studies before initiating anything in any of these locations to get a better feel. Uh, generic studies at times doesn't help, and particularly when you have COVID. Uh, when you have a COVID impacted environment, it's all the more imperative for us to kind of go to the ground, uh, talk to the people, find out what is, uh, what's been the impact like, uh, talk to the employers, uh, talk to all stakeholders and then come back to the drawing board and create a plan. So uh, we initiated a socio-economic survey, uh, you know, the survey uh, through few of these highlights. Uh, from a livelihood standpoint, we could identify that there has been a 76% drop in family income. 40% uh, youth and 45% fathers lost jobs. 70% of the women were either not working or with no jobs. And this has been consistent for the last uh, two decades, you know, uh, the data says so. 60% confirmed they didn't have any savings. This is again a matter of concern. Majority of the families, uh, they don't have it. Either they don't have the resources to save or don't have the habit of saving. So, and this is something that we also cover in our interventions to actually create better awareness about savings. So when COVID impacted, you know, they, they were really worried. They did not have money to kind of fall back on. A lot of them borrowed money. 60% uh, who lost jobs will pick up any any kind of work for living post uh, lockdown. And this is again a concern. So on one hand, we talk about career move, you know, picking up a specific skill, moving in a particular direction, you know, leveraging uh, the skill set or leveraging the market opportunities available versus here, uh, you know, it is about just picking up anything which is available so that there is living. You know, this can result into a very higher level of underemployment, uh, which is a bigger concern. 45% who lost jobs weren't sure of finding a job quickly post lockdown. You know, so they were not very sure. So they, uh, you know, those who were in jobs, they they were still looking at uh, uh, you know job losses in the, in the in the next month or so. So things were not very very uh, you know hopeful from their side. What are some top fears that uh, the families sort of faced uh, when we interacted with them? Income security uh, was right on top uh, and that too for very, very basic needs that they have. Fear of not being able to cover education cost of children. So families do think about education, particularly this is an urban focus study that we did and a lot of the majority of them, they were concerned about uh, the fact that, you know, they would not have money to invest in their or support their, um, you know, children's education. Uh, fear of sustained low income due to COVID impact. So it's not just about the immediate impact on income. It's also the sustained impact which will stay for some more time, probably a year, year and a half. They, they were not sure. And neither they were getting enough confidence from uh, the market or from other stakeholders in terms of when things will improve. So the, the, there is a very high level of fear there. Fear of moving <clears throat> deeper into poverty. Uh, so this is this also kind of ranked right on top in terms of Okay, uh, we 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 were so we are, we are already poor, you know, and now COVID has really pushed us, uh, you know, far below than where we are. And how do we come out of it? These were some uh, some questions that uh, they had no answers to, and they were really really in great fear, fear of getting infected. Again, a big fear. Uh, it was also seen as COVID was also seen as the rich man's disease. So they were like, uh, we still have to kind of go and and work in those areas, you know, and and also the hospital. Uh, you know, the healthcare system was not was not uh, uh, strong enough to kind of, you know, accommodate enough. So it was a bigger fear which kind of came out. What is also important for us to also note that, you know, what is the impact of loss of livelihoods on childhood? Uh, three things which stand out and which are, which is a very, very big concern. Is one is the risk of dropouts among children as well as youth who are into full-time education. Because 41% of the parents confirmed that they will, they will not be in a position to uh, you know, afford studies. So what about the full-time studies? How do we, how do they actually, uh, you know, afford it? Uh, second is children supporting economic activities through part-time or full-time engagement. 
so we are we may be looking at a rise of child labor cases uh, may come in light or may not but then yes this is going to push children into uh, you know supporting the families with economic activities uh, last is rise of early child um, you know marriage which is again a big concern i think through our interventions we've been able to really make a dent there but i think you know this is something which concerns us also and uh, uh, we are also trying to think innovatively how do we kind of you know uh, uh, arrest this coming to the key interventions and outcomes uh, you know uh, slide here so i would like to though there are multiple interventions i would like to highlight three critical interventions from an urban employment standpoint the first one is i'm a uh, employment linked skilling program which is like one of the main programs that we run so what are the clear outcomes so what is this program this program works uh, you know with employer so we actually partner with the industry first capture the demand capture the type of roles and try to align it with the aspirations of the area the youth who are in that area the vicinity so we try to kind of scan it so the the market scanning is very very uh, important at that sense that's a non negotiable activity that we do so once that is done that's when we actually go to the communities and you know we start counseling we start mobilizing we, we start enrolling them so what are the clear outcomes is come out of this um, you know two months uh, skilling program that we have one is we are able to look at interest based job related to training so we are connecting training with interest interest based jobs so people who show interest in the jobs that we been able to mobilize from the industry um, are the ones who come and they come with full commitment so our our dropout ratio is is next to uh, negligible i would say you know uh, there are many many batches that there wherein we don't even uh, have a single dropout in the batches so because we get the uh, matching right here right at the beginning 70% placement is a minimum that we target but our current ratio is anywhere between 80 to 85 i'm talking just pre covid uh, placement in high growth service sector so we are largely into service sector um, uh, service sector jobs and we have identified sectors like bfsi its hospitality retail uh, e-commerce so these are the sectors which are the primary drivers when it comes to urban jobs um, family income doubled so this is one of the outcome um, you know so when we hit the family you we only identify one person as the primary earning member because majority of the family women are not earning like about 70% of their time so uh, you know father through either self employment or through some small informal sector job earns and uh, uh, once we actually add a youth to the family though the income immediately doubles up and the family is in a better position from there on a faster career growth which this particular program offers so i'll not really go deeper into it because these are some of these could be common programs which other partners may also be doing but i would only be highlighting something wherein the program stands out and it makes a higher impact the second program is a digital employment marketplace program so this is like an employment exchange program run digitally uh, 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 and this this uh, at a faster note connects uh, the employee who's who's looking to get a job with the employer who does not know where to kind of go and find employees at large scale uh you know through technology so everything happens uh in a matter of hours uh, uh, from registration to assessment test and job matching and then final placement um so uh, what are the clear outcomes as far as this particular program is concerned uh interest based job matching and placement 70% plus placement we have faster employer employee connect on the job training inputs so all of these also also there uh, you know similar to the skilling program that we have but we also place them you know uh, in high growth service sectors the way we do it in skilling program uh, technology is at the heart of it and scale is at the heart of this program uh, last is micro entrepreneurship program i only want to highlight two programs here when we talk about micro entrepreneurship one is aspiring entrepreneurs program where we create new entrepreneurs second is working with existing nano and micro enterprises which uh, wherein we help them survive and then you know grow in the process we don't let them die so there are these clear outcomes in terms of those who come to us we 100% enterprises are set about 80% of the enterprises they return to pre covid income level 30% they go beyond pre covid income level and in the process they also become job creators in the next 18 to 24 months project challenges and learnings uh, you know i would like to just quickly highlight the challenges uh, with regard to skilling unrealistic aspirations from the youth with regard to job profile and salary nearby placements that's a big challenge uh, placement of women uh, not only from the community side but mainly from the industry side also it's difficult to kind of find employment opportunities for women that's been a challenge and that too when we have a very clear mandate of having a minimum 50% women as participants in our programs 
faster career growth so the youth you know they have a mismatch understanding of mismatch aspiration mismatch there so the moment they get into jobs they want faster career growth uh, and then the same is with other uh, audiences that we interact with when we look at digital employment marketplace program one of the problems that we face is availability of smartphones you know because only 65% of the youth with the smartphones uh, low chat training because this is a fast paced model uh, how do we actually take care of training you know so there are these uh, you know the black ones which i have mentioned are solutions that how do we actually work around this i'll be sharing this ppt for everyone's common knowledge and probably some of these will also be shared during the question answer session uh, uh, multiple as far as micro entrepreneurship program is concerned you know we the youth come with lot of ideas and they want to kind of roll out all of those ideas so helping them streamline one strong idea and starting the business on that is one second is how do they find the second round of funding initially we help them with seed money some they put from their pocket but then what about second round of funding without that the business may not really survive may not go the distance what about continuous mentoring support and all so these are some of the challenges and 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 the solutions that we could actually you know these are tried and tested solutions which have been giving us results a uh, last slide which is co-creation and scale up i would like to quickly uh, not talk about demand based skilling program because this is just about aligning with the industry and uh, catering to what the industry wants i would rather uh, bring everyone's focus to the urban livelihoods restoration program now uh, the covid has really impacted the families you know uh, probably the effort of one person may not really help the family come out of uh, the level of poverty that they are in now or they've been pushed to now i think it calls for a very very different set of approach Uh, so for faster recovery uh, and uh, you know we have to have a household based approach uh, here the idea is to actually increase the number of earning members in the family yeah i'll just take 30 seconds to wind it up uh, second is you know helping households revert to pre covid so one of the clear outcome is that when you actually work with uh, a household and uh, and create more earning members find employment for everyone uh, uh, economic activities for everyone you are able to help the family to recover you know revert to pre covid income level at a faster rate you also connect uh, them with the local nulm schemes like self employment program support to urban street vendors uh, sg programs a lot of the people on the ground they are not aware about these programs this is like a good partnership with nulm which can be forged and then taken to the communities and then you know people are helped with last is connect households with various social security schemes also uh, professor debolina touched upon it also in fact as far as micro entrepreneurship program is concerned uh, you know the idea is to connect newly created entrepreneurs with innovative business models like the marketplace model wherein they can actually have a wider reach and a faster uh, sort of uh, revenue generation opportunity last is identify and develop existing nano enterprises that is also the need of the r it's not just about creation of new enterprises but a lot of them get created organically or inorganically but then they also need to be supported so that they survive and they grow and then they also become job creators in the future thank you so very much happy to take questions yeah thank you anuj uh, we will take questions after the next presentation uh, we request you to stay with us until then sure okay With us, we have uh, Mr. Manoj Nayak, Manager, Microsoft Consulting, uh, for the next presentation. Uh, I request Manoj uh, to begin. Thank you, Manishri. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just uh, before I start, just a quick introduction. I am Manoj, and uh, I work at the in the banking, financial services, and insurance domain at. Uh, so, my to say, we work with uh, uh, so the uh, the aim uh, that the organization works with is uh, to provide meaningful financial, social, and economic inclusion. And uh, we work in both Asia and Africa. Uh, we have around one eighty staff over spread over ten uh, offices in Asia and Africa. And uh, so, our primary work revolves around uh, one one key area that we work is with the government. On improving as, uh, welfare delivery, and <clears throat> the other is we work with financial institutions to improve uh, their ability to serve low and middle income groups uh, uh, in in India and Africa, in India, Asia, and Africa. So, uh, for the presentation today, uh, I would like to before I start, I would like to thank uh, 
for Professor Devulina, um, Shanuj, and Mr. Varun also, for uh, because they have touched a lot of a uh, lot of points uh, that I will be sharing, uh, but it, uh, and, and and there are a lot of similarities between what we are trying to say. Um, yeah. Um, so, in terms of uh, what we'll, what I'll be sharing today is uh, uh, our work with micro, small, and medium enterprises, and also uh, some work that we are starting to build on uh, around technology platforms. Uh, we'll also try and discuss some co-creation ideas with other ILC members, and uh, considering the last two presentations. I, have, I find a uh, lot of similarities and then good uh, partner with each other on that. And then finally, we can have to take any questions. Um, so, why MSMEs? When, we, when we're talking about urban jobs, um, so the idea is uh, MSMEs in India actually contribute up to 30% of India's GDP and, uh, and employ close to 110 million people. And therefore, they are a very important sector from an urban job perspective. Uh, so, India has uh, approximately 63 million MSMEs, uh, and this will not include agriculture sector, MSM enterprises in the agriculture sector. Uh, and, and the urban and rural split uh, among the 63 million MSMEs is, is almost 50 50. 50. Um, and <clears throat> one inter so some key aspects around understanding MSMEs is uh, that almost 68% of all enterprises are unregistered and uh, within MSMEs you can see the chart uh, the, on the right hand side and, uh, the micro enterprises dominate uh, like more than 90% of all enterprises all MSMEs in India are uh, micro enterprises and even if when we see the form size uh, <clears throat> almost 84% of enterprises are uh, our own account enterprises, which basically means uh, tiny firms uh, and uh, no employees, uh, not, not even one employee. So, all the, and they constitute about 84% of all uh, enterprises. So, at MSC, our focus uh, mainly has been uh, uh, so, from a jobs perspective, is uh, the idea is if we are able to scale or able to uh, scale and formalize micro enterprises uh, in. Uh, so they will be able to create uh, additional employment, and as um, and the hope is when they formalize, they are the, they they are able to provide stable wages and a safety net to informal workers. So almost 40 percent of India's informal workers are uh, are, uh, are provided employment by MSMEs. Next slide. So, uh, uh, in terms of uh, to, to, to give you an understanding of uh, to give you a flavor of what NSF uh, Microsave does, when we say we work with micro uh, and small enterprises uh, in India. So, our, our primary uh, so this is an example of a of a project that we did, and uh, so we were we supported on five non-banking financial institutions in India uh, in uh, to support. Uh, then uh, build up a portfolio where they are able to serve urban MSMEs, and, and the idea again being for them to uh, provide a compelling value proposition for uh, for financial institutions to serve the urban segment. Uh, in terms of uh, who are these five uh, institutions, so we work with uh, microfinance institutions. Uh, most of uh, any, uh, people with an experience in the financial inclusion sector will. Uh, we we'll know that MFI is traditionally focused on the rural segment. So our work was also to create a, 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 a vertical for them so that they and to create an understanding of the urban MSME segment so that financial institutions are able to serve them. So uh, uh, we did, uh, so all of this were end to end. So we did, we started with the segmentation of the urban micro and small enterprise market. Uh, we designed a product uh, that we could uh, serve uh, and we could onboard urban microfinance, uh, sorry, urban enterprises, <coughs> and and we also did a strategy. Uh, we do we also help uh, non-banking financial institutions develop strategies for uh, in terms of serving the urban sector. 
so two key areas intervention areas that we did was um, so but typically an urban entrepreneur a micro entrepreneur will not have a banking history and that results in a lot of exclusion so um, in a way, uh, we we, uh, we worked with one of the enterprise there and uh, we helped them develop a uh, statistical credit scoring tool which uh, which is able to uh, assess the credit worthiness based on uh, very little data very little uh, formal data so which we usually call the pinfile customers we sort of uh, identified and help and and then apply the credit scoring tool um and and uh, working with a lot of micro enterprises or you uh, we also found that financial literacy um uh, as it uh, so when most of the uh, when you when and and if i is able to provide a loan to a customer uh the micro entrepreneur and if i usually find that the financial literacy of the customer is not uh, uh, like it, it needs improved so uh as is um, and and the moment you are uh, they try to do individual lending to uh, uh, infile customers the worry was around uh, ensuring repayments because uh, mfis were moving from a uh, <coughs> liability joint liability group to a social collateral model um, so so these were two, the two ideas that uh, on on the two interventions on urban msmes next slide Uh, the next topic i wanted to discuss was on uh, uh, some work around urban jobs uh, arising from due to the uh, due to digital platforms so digital platforms should be still or, or gig workers platforms which are onboarding gig workers so what uh, what has changed from an urban jobs perspective is the barriers to entry for jobs has gone down uh, uh so be zomato or be swiggy uh, ola or uber uh, Uh, there is something there is an employment avenue now available for gig workers uh, but it also has its own uh, challenges so while uh, gig work uh, might resemble a lot like formal employment in terms of uh, working for a registered enterprise or working uh, or fixed or uh, at this timely pay if you are uh, if you are working there full time timely pay and payment uh, ha- happening to a bank account so those things are there but formalization and it associated social security benefits that is not available now and then the platform economy can uh, support participation of women uh, in terms of uh, their uh, flexible policies around reentry uh, like women uh, at different stages of uh, their life we know that they have to pull back from the workforce Uh, but uh, the gig workers and gig gig platforms allow women to uh, re-enter the workforce without much uh, cost. So that is a positive. But having said all, uh, having said all of this, there is uh, uh, the, the COVID-19 crisis has actually highlighted a lot of uh, uh, lot of challenges in terms of uh, and uh, as Professor Devlin also said uh, and also. Arun mentioned this that this invisibilization. I think the COVID-19 crisis made it made the uh, uh, made this uh, those issues and challenges around informal workers. It made it made it visible for all of us. I think so. Then this time uh, this is basically an opportunity for us to reimagine a social safety net for the informal workers. Next slide. so so again this is just an example one one more example of our work with uh, with, with the gig platform so this is in kenya uh, we we provided technical assistance to link link is a gig workforce platform in kenya and basically we helped them design design concepts product concepts to take care of uh, so uh, the platform was looking at the risk from uh, for its own perspective like risk for the platform but it was also willing to and uh, trying to work towards how do i protect or how do i uh, provide social security benefits to my uh, to people who are uh, to professionals who are providing their services on my platform and then also uh, in terms of uh, examples like financial services uh, because the payments and pay is pay will depend on how much work you are able to do and because of the volatility in income how do i then manage or help my 
help professionals on the platform to manage their financial services and uh, uh, financial education needs and also in terms of skill development how to have, uh, can be learned. so we are sort of looking at uh, developing a uh, accreditation program so that uh, 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 professionals on the platform are able to improve their skills and therefore uh, improve their income so that they have so just last one more slide. Yeah. So in terms of opportunities for cooperation, I think uh, some of these ideas have been discussed. But uh, from a uh, skill development perspective, uh, I just want to highlight a very specific need. So at NSC uh, for COVID, we are also conducting a lot of researches on uh, micro and the impact of COVID-19 on MSMEs. And uh, so what we found was. Uh, especially in uh, uh, people who are able to provide, continue with offering services because they were classified as essential services, uh, there is some shift towards digitalization. And uh, uh, so, so then, uh, but that is also a challenge because people uh, still we find that there is an hesitance towards adopting digital payment system, uh, digital payments. Um, and uh, so that we see it as an opportunity that how can we uh, work with partners to digitize or create financial and digital literacy tools that we, micro entrepreneurs could use. In terms of social security, so Dwara, Dwara Trust has, a, has, uh, has research around uh, universal say, social security schemes and, and so, so then uh, can we look at research and design of social security plans for gig workers, but also for informal workers who are not uh, on, gig, uh, on gig work platforms. And in terms of gender, um, uh, again, uh, considering the gig work, uh, so the impact of uh, gig work on female labor force, I think that is an area that needs further exploration and also uh, programs, uh, as uh, Mr. Anup mentioned, uh, programs to improve female labor force participation. So these are the areas I think we could uh, explore that is all that I have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anuj. Uh, uh, thank you, Anuj and uh, Mr. Manoj both. So we have two questions for you. Uh, so the first question is to uh, is addressed to Mr. Manoj. Uh, so in the uh, in the digital employment marketplace project that you have worked upon. Uh, the question is, have you looked into the interview preparation, coping in workplace environment and terms of contracts and benefits? Uh, hi, Bhagishri. I think the question is targeted at Anuj. Uh, so I'm, I'm responding to that because I covered uh, okay. the digital employment piece. Uh, yes. Good question, uh, because uh, at the heart of this, uh, you know, this intervention or call it the program, uh, since it is a highly scalable program so it connects employees and employers at scale number one number two it 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 matches competencies with the available job opportunities um, at a minimum level which the employer calls for uh, and then rest of the competencies are built on the job unlike a skilling program wherein the competency matching the, uh, or honing take you know is taken up to a level of about 70 75 percent or 80 percent that's not how it, uh, the digital employment exchange works. You know, if the minimum employment um, require, competency requirement is about uh, 50% or 45%, you know, uh, then uh, the matching happens and then uh, the employer takes over from there. Now, in terms of coverage of uh, topics like um, or subjects like job preparedness, training, interview preparation and new normal workplace, yes, now this is an important part of the curriculum framework considering the new normal workplace which they have to kind of be in. So how do you um, work in a, an environment wherein social distancing ha will be maintained strictly? How do you keep, uh, you know, how do you know about the, uh, the the health and safety guidelines? So all of these we cover uh, and, uh, you know, job preparedness from an interview skills preparation or uh, and, and grooming aspect, definitely that's a part of it. In terms of contracts and benefits, we give them an overview because our employer selection process is very stringent. Uh, you know, there are formal and organized employees also we have rejected uh, because of, uh, you know, uh, some policies not in place and we've heard a lot of complaints. So our employer screening is very, very much in place. So that means that a lot of these statutory guidelines are taken care by the employer already. Uh, 
uh, we do still try to kind of just touch upon it but you know there is only as much that the youth can grasp and the time frame is also very very less for us to really have this also covered at a larger scale but we are involved in the salary negotiation we are involved in the joining formality so we have complete visibility so that the youth is not taken for a ride so our our, our people on ground they are totally associated with the employer as well as with the youth in the entire process till the time the youth is is onboarded uh, at the employer so hope i have answered your question yes thank you uh, so the next question is for mr nayak um so this is regarding the msme decategorization and its impact and uh, the the audience has asked if this will be detrimental for the small msmes wherein the larger msmes uh, get better share of the benefits thank you mahesh yeah uh, so in terms of uh, the recategorization i i um, you know, uh, i i sort of agree that uh, it might it it may be detrimental to those uh, small micro enterprises or small enterprises basically um, uh, but uh, when we see this uh, uh, the, the sector we have to realize that uh, the bank so uh, in terms of uh, financial institutions that serve micro enterprises uh, they are typically either banks which are public sector banks mostly or there will be nbfcs which are focused on the low and middle middle income categories so uh, and most micro enterprises as per as uh, uh, in term in our experience uh, and you will usually be served by the nfis or the nbfcs of course so in terms of uh, uh, in terms of providing services uh, to micro enterprises because already uh, nbfcs and nfis are doing the uh, providing services i think in the long term it might not be detrimental uh, but specifically for the covid 19 relief and uh, uh, this uh, because a lot of the relief has been Uh, and is being pushed through the banks through the banking system and banks already do not offer uh, or uh, do not have micro enterprises as their customers uh, in the short term i think we will see some effect of um, detrimental effect of it but the, over the long term i, I think it will adjust to micro enterprises will reach out to and uh, micro uh, sorry enterprises will reach out to micro enterprises so it should not be in the long term it should not be Okay thank you 